Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I, um, I, I almost missed another week of the show, but I am starting to get on top of things with scheduling. I just, uh, I had a lot going on with work and work travel. And, um, on top of that, my six month oncologist check-in appointment to see if my leukemia had progressed. Um, that's sort of been, been looming in the back of my mind, but that was yesterday. Um, the appointment that is, um, and while I was getting pretty worked up about it, uh, much more so than the, the previous couple of check-ins. Um, my numbers were just fine. I am still at stage zero, uh, nowhere near the uh, t- uh, rate of increase uh, in white blood cell count where I'd need to, to start treatment. So um, so no danger there. Yay. I uh, get another six months. Um, not sure why this one had me as worked up as it did. I um, was probably tied to my pal who recently got walloped with a, a glioblastoma out of the blue a few months ago, as well as some other uh, intimations of mortality that, that have cropped up lately. But now I can just uh, go on and, and have the lower level background anxiety for the, the, the next six months. And uh, yeah, we'll see where we go from there. I mean, and even beyond that stuff, I, I do feel like I've been... Uh, lurching from crisis to crisis uh the the last few months and it's it's crises large and and small mainly self-created um so i really have to figure out how to stop reacting like that or figure out what's what's underlying it all i guess but i do have a prospective guest for next week who i'm I'm waiting to hear back from before i i panic my way into another mini crisis We'll, we'll see um but there is unalloyed good news I, I want to share. Um, the second issue of my zine, Haiku for Business Travelers, arrived from the, the printer last week. Um, and the print job was great. It, it's beautiful to, to look at. I'm really happy with how it came out. I've mailed about 180 of them out so far. My, my full distro list is around uh, 375, 400 people. And a bunch of them are outside the U.S., so that's going to take me a while because those have to go through the U.S. post office instead of metering them here and blah, blah, blah. So um, if you want to get a copy of this zine, um, my, my haiku for business travelers, as, as I call it, uh, let me know and send me your mailing address. Um, I should also have a second printing of the first issue back this week. So if you never got that one, let me know. Uh, it's free. Um, it's print only. So no PDF or anything, just a 32 page print artifact of my essays, poems, art, photos. Um, each one's got an excerpt of a, a podcast conversation. The, uh, first issue featured my talk with, uh, the poet or the late poet, Sandy McClatchy. And the second one, uh, has, uh, some of my great Clive James interview from 2015. Um, Anyway, I, I, I will admit I am kind of thrilled to, to have this in my hands. I, I, I'm already hearing from people who receive their copies in the mail, um, which is a hoot. And it's, it's great to get this out in the world. Um, anyway, I'm hoping to make the zine on a, a semi-annual basis rather than the three year gap between the first and second issues. But, you know, I don't want to create yet another crisis for myself. Speaking of, let's get to this week's show. So my guest this week is Andrew Porter, who has a wonderful new short story collection out now from Knopf called The Disappeared. Um, the stories in The Disappeared are are graceful, beautifully written, not quite minimalist, not quite stark pieces of a middle-aged life. Each of the, the first-person narrators, uh, and they're all guys in their 30s and 40s, which was not exactly 
the point, but just sort of how the selection shook out, Andrew uh, uh, told me, and he'll tell us during the conversation. Each of those narrators finds himself in this uh, in this world where possibilities are narrowing and and decisions can't be undone and and patterns start to seem inexorable and the disappearances uh both both material and and you know kind of figurative well, they seem to, to outpace the discoveries even you know when there's a, a an epiphany or a a mystery that seems to be just out of reach Andrew, his narrators aren't um, lost exactly, but, you know, they sure aren't found. And he, he captures that vibe just beautifully across the, the 15 stories in The Disappeared. And, and those range from like one page flash fiction to a 30 page deep exploration of a a couple that each lose or, or find something uh, in in each of their relationships with a, a neighbor who lives downstairs. Um, and other stories are right in between eight, 10 pages and, and, you know, a lot of domesticity and, um, well, as a 52 year old guy who spends a lot of time contemplating the range or arc of, of one's life or lack thereof. Um, I was just utterly captivated by Andrew's stories because his characters, and not just the narrators, but but their partners and and their children and their friends, they all felt utterly human in their their frustrations and in in the choices that they make and the things they say and don't say to one another and and how they observe the the world around them. Uh, speaking of that world, um, almost all of the stories that he, he writes for this collection take place in San Antonio or Austin, except for one in, in Rhinebeck, New York. But even there, the characters are contemplating a move to Austin and it's sort of pre hip and pre Tesla Austin. Um, but that, that recurring concrete sense of, of place as you, you see different aspects of it through these, these different characters lives, it makes the stories even more compelling. I mean, there's no, um, there's no direct continuity thing threading them all together, but beyond these, these places in which they all live, but it creates this, this really compelling and, 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 and heightened lived in quality to the, the stories. I just love the disappeared. Um, each piece in it is a gem. It's a short book, about a, a 220 pages or so. Um, I hope you give it a read and I hope you, um, you see something of yourself as you, depending on who you are and how old you are and what decisions you made in life, that you, you see what we've decided and what, what room we still have to, to grow or how we respond to, to the things we've already done and the people in the world around us. I'm prattling. Anyway, um, I want to thank a uh, recent guest, Priscilla Gilman, for connecting me with Andrew uh, because I love the the great chain of podcastery. Uh, when I mentioned to her, her, when I mentioned to people online that I was uh, once again looking into a weekend without a guest ahead, she's like, you have to talk to Andrew. And um, I got the book, just, just devoured it. And we had this wonderful conversation that you're about to hear. So thank you, Priscilla. Now, here's Andrew's bio. Andrew Porter is the author of the story collection, The Theory of Light and Matter, and the novel In Between Days. A graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, he has received a Pushcart Prize, a James Mishner slash Copernicus Fellowship, and the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction. His work has appeared in One Story, The Three Penny Review, and Plowshares, and on Public Radio's Selected Shorts. Currently, he teaches fiction writing and directs the creative writing program at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. His new short story collection is The Disappeared. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Andrew Porter. How did The Disappeared take shape? as a short story collection? Yeah, it, it's a great question. You know, um, it didn't start with the concept of disappearance. Um, you know, I just actually just started writing stories and I started writing these stories after 
um, a couple years after my both my children had been born, and I'd gone through a period of kind of not writing for a while and and just kind of trying to figure out how to write um, in this new kind of reality that I was in. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I sat down one day after not writing for quite a while, and I started writing the opening of the story Austin and. Um, and I spent about a week, um, working on that story. And when I finished that story, I felt like it had opened up this kind of new world for me to explore. And so the book really grew out of that story. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I had a sabbatical coming up, but I thought what I want to do in the sabbatical is kind of work with the world that I introduced in the story, Austin with some of the themes and conflicts, um, this, this time in, in life, um, this particular setting of like Austin and San Antonio. And I just wanted to kind of do like, um, riffs on that in a way, like variations (laughs) on, on that. And, um, and I wasn't thinking of it as a book, but as I wrote more and more of these stories dealing with characters at this particular time in life, it began to feel, more like a connected work. Um, and then about halfway through, I wrote the final story in the book, The Disappeared. So it wasn't the last story that I wrote, but I, I wrote it about halfway through. And when I wrote that story and I knew it was going to be called The Disappeared, I just, something clicked in my head and I thought, okay, this is, this is going to be important to what this book is about. And this book is probably going to be called (laughs) the disappeared and and so that's it's a kind of long answer to your question but that that's how it kind of came about it wasn't something that i you know it wasn't a book that i that i began with a concept it it really just grew organically out of me exploring um this new kind of fictional space that had emerged when i wrote that story austin was there a point at which you you thought of titling it days of wine and cigarettes or or was that just me projecting (laughs) i didn't but no that's been pointed out to me a lot um uh you know since the book has been out that there are lots of references or lots of the characters drink wine um i think you know my answer to that question has been you know during that period of time just after our children were born you know um there was this ritual my wife and I would have, you know, after the kids went to bed, we would sit down and have a glass of wine and kind of decompress and talk about our days. And so a lot of my kind of, uh, a lot of the scenes kind of, I think emerged out of that, you know, this idea of a couple dealing with um, the conflicts in their life at this age, kind of coming together at the end of the day and, and really having, their main conversations then usually over a glass of wine. And so um, I, I think that part of the reason that that element, you know, that recurring image um, occurs in the story is, is, is linked to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sticking with, with male narrators, first person uh, male narrators throughout I haven't read your previous stuff, so I don't know how often you've you've either done third or approached from a, a female perspective. But again, how much did that feel natural in in the relationship to the stories and what you were going through in in life? Yeah, you know that that came more in the shaping of the book after the fact. Um, you know, I've written from the perspective of women in, in my first collection. I did and in my novel, two of the four perspectives were female characters. And I wrote a number of the stories that I wrote during this period were also from the perspective of, of women. Um, but as I was kind of winnowing it down and picking the pieces that seemed, um, to connect to each other the best and that kind of fit together. And that also kind of on their own just worked well. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, that, the, some of those other stories kind of just naturally got cut out. And so it was, there were a lot of factors involved in it, but it, it was not necessarily a, a kind of conscious decision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And talk about disappearance. I mean, in, in the book, it is occasionally an actual disappearance of someone, but there's also the 
um, the disappearing of possibility, the disappearing of the the younger. So I'm doing the answering for you. Tell me about disappearance. <laughs> the yes, all of all of the above. You know, um, it, it was about you know disappearance takes various forms in in the book. There is the kind of literal disappearances that occur, like in the final story in the book, um, where where a, a character actually goes missing. But then, you know, most of the disappearances are more kind of metaphorical. And, and again, they, I, I think it really grew out of the fact that I was, I was feeling at that time in my life, like a lot of things that had existed in my life prior to this time were disappearing. You know, I, I felt like, um, I wrote kind of a short essay about this, but I, I felt, um, I felt like a lot of kind of my twenties and thirties were about accumulating things, <laughs> yeah. adding things to my life, um, you know, uh, and, and acquiring things and, and, and so forth. And then I began to notice like shortly after I was, um, married and, and, and had kids that a lot of those things from earlier times in my life began to disappear. And so I think that's why that feeling emerges so strongly in the stories. Um, in some cases, right. It's the disappearance of, a younger self. In other cases, it's the disappearance of a relationship. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's many, it takes many different forms, but I think it grew out of that feeling that I think a lot of people have, um, as they enter their forties, right. Is that suddenly, um, people and things and, you know, abstract <laughs> elements of their life begin to disappear. You and I are just about the same age. I'm, I'm 52. And uh, going throughout the book, I kept thinking, boy, I hope we really don't get too deep into discussing how middle age is going. But but I think that's <laughs> going to be an ongoing thread throughout this this conversation. So uh, now I have no kids. Um, and, and it was conscious decision on, on my wife and my part. But you had a line in the, the book about um, how parenthood will change you, uh, paraphrasing it here somewhat, but um, just not in the way people make you think it'll change you. It doesn't fill some big void or something. It doesn't solve anything. It just makes things different, sometimes better and sometimes worse. Not to ascribe your feeling to your character's comments, but uh, you mentioned the, the the changeover in you know having to accommodate the writing life to being a parent. You know, what else changed in terms of, of becoming a parent and becoming a father? Yeah, I mean, I think... I mean, so much changes and, and that's part of the reason I was having such a hard time writing is because, you know, I was looking at work that I'd been doing prior to my children being born and they were born pretty close together. Um, and so prior to that, like that work was just not resonating with my reality now. You know, I think mm -hmm. my whole, um, yeah, the, the way what's important to you in the world, like completely shifts, you know, the, the cliche about that is really true that, that your focus becomes suddenly your children and their well being, And, um, you know, prior to that, I've been living my life as someone who basically just thought, you know, my writing and, and my relationship with my wife and, and my friendships were all kind of at the center of my world. And now there was this kind of new element that, that took precedence and, and, and that, um, that shifted everything. And I didn't know how to write about <laughs> that for a long time. Yeah. Is there a sense this, this came up with a cartoonist I was uh, recording with a, a few months ago, a sense of, boy, someday my kids are actually going to read this. <laughs> or I hope someday my kids are actually going to read this. They may have no interest in dad's, uh, dad's writing at all. Yeah. My, my daughter has been kind of begging me to read it and she's 11 now and too young for this book or, yeah. or any of my books really. Um, but she's a voracious reader and, and keeps asking that at what age she'll be able to read it. And I, I, I keep changing it, I'm, you know, maybe 30. <laughs> um, but, but truly, I mean, I, I don't think too much about that. Just like I don't really think about all of the people in my life who are going to read while I'm writing. I think that's too, it can be too kind of crippling if, if you worry about that, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't think about my, try not to think about my parents or my, and my, my friends or my siblings or my partner, or, you know, any of 
those people. Like I just, um, if I did, I think I would be way too self-conscious and I, I wouldn't write the stories that I write probably. Um, Which is how you answer the, why hasn't Gil ever written anything part of the, the conversation? <laughs> well, <laughs> now, I don't I'll know wait how my parents are gone, then I'll, I'll get to it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how nonfiction writers do it. I mean, that, that to me is really, that's, that's another level of, I don't think I could, I can do that. Um, you th in, think in terms of that sense of being an expert or, or, or positioning yourself as an expert in, in the subject? Or yeah, do you I mean, mean I, can, I can just yeah. say it's fiction. It's all made up, right? It's not, yeah. this is not you. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has nothing to do with you. Um, this came from my imagination, which it is most of the time is the truth. Um, but nonfiction writers can't hide behind that, right? And they have to kind of they have to actually deal with the people that they've written about after the fact. And to me, I think that, that would be just too paralyzing um, and, and it would be really difficult. So I, I admire um, nonfiction writers so much for that reason. You could be like Clive James and call your book Unreliable Memoirs and, and kind of undercut. <laughs> that's, <laughs> no. that's true. That's, that, that's, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> kind of cut the Gordian knot right there and, and was able to... to yeah, take some liberties, but, mm -hmm. but tell me about the, the use of in, in the stories, many of them, uh, either the, the narrator himself or more often, uh, another character he's involved with is an artist of some kind. And that, that choice on your part to, to be, if not directly, because the characters tend not to be making art in the moment, but it suffuses their lives. You know, can you, can you speak a little about the, the, how you found yourself writing that that sort of uh, variations on that throughout the book? Yeah, and and that was something that also kind of a lot of these these kind of um, thematic elements that are connected grew out of the kind of choosing of the story. So again, as I was kind of assembling the book, I began to notice this kind of art theme or the art making theme, um, the creative process theme, and. Um, and so I, I kind of leaned into that in terms of the stories that, that I was choosing to, to include. But I think it also um, fits really well with what the book is about, which is, you know, largely like our relationship with younger versions of ourselves or different versions of ourselves. And I think artists in particular have, um, you know, a really kind of intense relationship with <laughs> different mm -hmm. versions of themselves, just because I think artists tend to put, you know, think of their, their life in terms of periods, right? Periods of work. You know, this is when I was working on this type of thing. This is when this was my subject matter. And so you find yourself thinking a lot about those different versions of yourself and who you were in those moments and what was important to you in those moments. And I really wanted to kind of make that a, a big theme in, in the book. And so I presented or tried to present a lot of different types of artists at a lot of different stages in their life and in their career, you know, so you have like the young kind of, um, phenom who's just emerging in the story like vines. Um, you have the kind of older, more jaded artist, um, who's kind of past their prime looking back on their best work. You have the kind of stunted artist, you have, um, you know, like the kind of uh, hermit artist, <laughs> you have a lot of different types of um, artists and a lot of uh, different versions of, of that type of artistic life. And um, yeah, so I just wanted that. Uh, I felt like it fit, fit well with, with what the book was about. It does raise the natural question of outside of dad Andrew versus pre dad Andrew. Do you see different periods and phases in your work? I do. I really do. I mean, I think even kind of going back to before I was, I, I started writing fiction, you know, I think of my life, you know, like my, my young, young years as being, you know, like when I was a young child, like being all about visual art, which I was very passionate about at that time you know, my teenage years were all about music and songwriting and just obsessively listening to music, going to shows, um, you know, you know, entering college, it was film. And that's what I wanted to, to be, you know, as a filmmaker. And then I kind of got into writing and then with each, yeah, kind of different 
periods in my life, like um, I saw my kind of fictional interest changing with each of my three books. They're about three different things entirely or three different kind of periods in life entirely. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do tend to think of my life in terms of different creative periods. Do you have a, a character in, in the big story looking at his, well, the, the sort of title story, looking at his past work on someone else's wall and kind of being embarrassed and, and you know, noting that his, his wife refers to it as his juvenilia? Um, right. Not to discredit your own past writing, but, you know, what <laughs> I guess is, is either easier or even tougher for you now as a writer what do you look at in terms of, of what you've learned, I suppose? Yeah, I don't tend to have, I mean, I definitely have some, some cringe worthy <laughs> work <laughs> that, that has not ever, never seen the light of day that, that that's from my college years and like early. You know, yeah. Years. But that's, so, yeah. You know. <laughs> um, and I actually just recently, um, my, my mom, had uncovered these poems that I'd written oh, when no, I was like so 20. <laughs> I know I was like in, I was traveling in France when I was like 20 and I was writing poetry and I, was, I vaguely remember that. And then, you know, so these, that's an example of something that will never see the light of day, but, um, but, but no, I mean, in terms of the stuff I've published, I mean, you, I don't tend to re reread my old work unless I have to, for an occasion, you know, like, uh, you know, if like I was, you know, like a, a class was like talking about a story from my first book or something. And I was talking to them about it. But other than that, like, I just will never, I don't look back at old work. I'm not um, particularly interested in, in looking at it. And, um, and part of the reason for that is because my tendency is to kind of have regrets and, and to see things I wish I did, did differently. And, nothing good comes really from <laughs> revisiting old stuff published or un unpublished sometimes. Um, yeah. but, uh, so I, I tend to kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I'm always kind of most interested in what I'm working on at the moment. Um, but yeah, certainly I think all writers have past work that they, um, yeah. yeah, that they just cringe at. <laughs> it's, uh, natural. it's not even writers; it, it, it's everybody. You know, we, yeah. we all have something that we thought we made once upon a time. But, but you know, beyond that, it's you're currently at two short story collections and and one novel. Outside of the economics of one versus the other, preference. Do you prefer the 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 shorter fiction yeah. or or you know getting into the the long? I, I like them both for different reasons. I think they have their kind of distinct pleasures. Um, you know, with the novel, the pleasure is really getting to kind of spend a long period of time with the same characters and be in the same world and not have to be constantly thinking up new situations and new worlds, right? Um, there's something really lovely about that, um, that kind of deep plunge. But my first love and, and probably my forever love is going to be the short story form. I just, I have always, that was kind of what got me into writing. Um, and, and I've always felt most comfortable working in the story form. And, and so, yeah, I mean, if, if I had to choose one or the other, I, I would probably choose stories. You mentioned that circuitous route to, to a writing, we'll say career, because, you know, career sounds good. What was the, the sort of the moment for you when you realized, you know, fiction writing was was it and, and sort of who were the early influences that got you in that way? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I had not read... I had read short stories like in high school, but they were kind of, you know, curriculum. Stuff. Yeah. Nathaniel Hawthorne and, you know, Bartleby the Scrivener, all of which are like great stories, but you know, th these were not stories that kind of reminded me of, of my life or that, that I, that resonated with, with me in a strong way. Um, but I took a short story course my first year in college and at the end of the course, we kind of moved through different American short story writers. And at the very end of the course, there was a unit on contemporary short story writers. And in that class, I was just introduced to 
um, all of these writers who are just kind of writing about the world, uh, the contemporary world and using very kind of plain spoken contemporary language. And um, it just blew my mind that, that these things existed. I had no idea. <laughs> and, um, you know, Joyce Carol Oates and Lori Moore and Amy Hempel and, you know, Carver, of course, and, you know, um, you know, uh, Joy Williams and these types of writers, like, I mean, these were, you know, these stories were like, unlike anything I'd ever seen. And um, around the same time, my parents kind of knowing this new interest um, got me uh, for Christmas, they got me the best American short stories of that year. And they thought, Oh, I think you'll like this. And I remember reading that volume. And I just, again, I was just kind of blown away by these stories. And um, so that was the moment when I kind of fell in love with the form. And I decided then to take a short story kind of workshop um, the next semester, kind of, this would be like my sophomore year. And, um, and, and then I discovered that I really liked trying to do it myself and um, really liked working within the forum. And I had a very generous, um, kind professor um, named Dean Crawford, and he um, was way too kind to me, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he, he saw something in the work and he, and he really said, you know, I think you should take another one of these classes. I think maybe you can, you can do this. Um, and so I took another fiction writing class and that class was with, um, the, the professor who would end up kind of being my, my mentor, um, this writer, David Wong Louie. Um, and through working with him and through his encouragement, I kind of gained more and more confidence in my ability. But it was scary. I don't know. It's hard to find that one point. Like it was in college that I knew that I wanted to do it. Um, I just didn't know if I was going to do it because it was very scary to me. The idea of, um, yeah, of I mean, it's a it's it's <laughs> it's a risky life. No one, none of my other friends were thinking about doing anything like that. Um, my parents were nervous about it. You know, I was going to ask. I mean, they, they yeah. got you the collection and then realized, what have we done? What, what? Right. <laughs> well, that's the irony is my parents, like I grew up in a house full of books. My parents, both huge readers and just, you know, pushing the classics on me and, and, you know, from an early age and reading is the most important thing. And then, you know, as soon as I wanted to actually, yeah, we didn't say <laughs> writing was career, a critical. They're yeah. like, <laughs> they were yeah. just, I think, not prepared for that. Um, and and so, yeah, they were very concerned about it. Um, you know, kind of supportive, but from a, a cautious distance. And um, and so, yeah. And then I went to grad school, and it was really in grad school that I think that I and I went pretty young. I was like twenty three um, when I entered grad school, and I think that. Um, it was there that I met other people around my age or a little bit older who were, who were committing themselves without question to this life. And I was just kind of shocked by that, that they were so certain that this is who they were and this is what they were going to do. Yeah. And they had, you know, they didn't have the same types of doubts that I did, or they didn't, they didn't seem to, uh, on the surface. And, and that had a hugely you know, profound kind of impact on me. Um, I would say the humorous thing is when you meet those people and you discover your writing is far better than theirs and they have no doubts whatsoever about their future success, <laughs> but I'm not going to put you in that, that sort of yeah. scenario. I'm, I'm just saying in a, a hypothetical sort of way that may have happened in my life, but yeah. <laughs> now, we, we've also been teaching for, well, for more than 20 years now. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the general, uh, you know, um, how you teach and, and, you know, what student, how students have changed, but what did you see in terms of yourself as a student when it came to, to teaching creative writing? Yeah. You know, I, I, um, it, it was interesting, you know, I, I had some good models. I had a lot of different models for different types of writing teachers when I was mm -hmm. in grad school. Um, you know, and I went um, to the to the program at Iowa, and, and at the time, um, 
Frank Conway was like the director of the program and he was a very kind of, uh, he's a wonderful teacher, but a kind of very intimidating <laughs> figure um, who would kind of go through student stories line by line and question everything. And you would, you were really like nervous going up for workshop in his workshops. Um, and then I also had a professor like Marilyn Robinson, who was a really generous, um, wonderful um, presence as a workshop leader. And, and um, I worked with Barry Hanna, who was kind of wild, um, but also a really um, kind of incredible reader of stories. And so they all were a little bit different. And I kind of took little elements of each one, I think, when I started teaching myself, although I probably Marilyn's model was kind of the one that I, I most strongly adapted. Um, and it really had more to do with just kind of creating a type of environment in my classes that felt really um, safe and supportive and, um, you know, and, and, and that um, was conducive to creating art. <laughs> and, you know, so I tended to kind of as, as a, a teacher go more in, in that direction. But, um, there are elements of like Frank Conroy's class, like things he talked about, things that I still use in my classes. Um, I also worked with Jim McPherson, James Allen McPherson, and he similarly, like there are things that he, that he talked about that I, that I find myself using. So I don't know. I think that's probably the case with most people who go on to, to teach fiction writing is that they're pulling, different things from different teachers and, and um, kind of trying to create uh, an environment that resembles the ones that were most um, effective for them mm -hmm. as a student. Is there a, I, I asked because last week's guest, who was also a short fiction writer and a, a teacher discussed this sort of a, a totemic short story that you, you teach in almost every class. And have you tried not teaching it and wondered what was going to, because this is what happened to him as a Tobias Wolf, uh, bullet to the brain, uh, oh, uh yeah, story yeah, yeah. that he That's... chose not to use last semester and just threw everything off. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> you know, he's like, I, I think I have to go back to using that every single time. So, yeah, I mean, there have been, there are definitely stories that I, that I teach. I, I think I call them like my money in the bank stories. There are yeah. ones like. I don't even have to like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, prepare for this class because the students are going to love this story so much, you know, that we're just, they're going to, you know, um, that stories that you can just kind of rely on for a long time. I always started my classes with this very short story by John Cheever called reunion. Um, mm -hmm. and it's just like a three page story, but it's a kind of perfect model of the story form. It's really funny. You can do a great close reading of it. It's like one of the most teachable stories. And it's it's also a great way to kind of introduce the form to students. So I taught that like every class, every semester for many, many years. <laughs> and then at one point, I think I, as much as I love that story, I was like, I'm starting to not like <laughs> this story anymore. And, and that's wrong because it's a great story. So I've had stories that I've retired partly for that reason, you know, just kind of like, I just got myself kind of tired of talking about them. Mm -hmm. Um, but one I should story, ask, are, are there ones that have, that you have retired because of changing student sensibilities? Well, we'll put yes. It, yeah. And I always find that really interesting, right? You know, like, um, a kind of change in the times, um, sometimes. And one of those was, um, I had always taught you know, from when I was a grad student at Iowa and I was first teaching, um, you know, at that time, like, um, Dennis Johnson's Jesus's son was like the, the yeah. <laughs> short story collection that, that everybody aspired to probably still is to some extent, but, um, the, I always taught the story emergency and that was like, you know, like I couldn't wait till that class in the semester because the students always loved it. And it was, you know, it was just always a smash hit. And that went all the way through kind of my early years teaching at Trinity University, where I teach now. And then at a certain point, um, I started getting these strange reactions to stories where students were like, um, not really picking up on the dark humor um, and not really 
kind of yeah delighting in the many delights of that story and 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 in some cases like being up you know like there's the yeah. the scene with like the bunnies in that story and like <laughs> they were just not suddenly not having it you know and i thought wow like and and a couple of times i got like a little bit I internally, I will not, I didn't voice this, but internally, like a little defensive, like this is one of the great, you know, short story writers ever. And one of the great stories. And, um, but I realized like this was something was going on right in the, in the, it was a new generation. And, 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 um, and, and so I just, after a while, it's thought it's better for me to not teach it than to try to kind of yeah. teach it and, 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 and have a teachable see, moment around yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you have to just listen to the students. Like sometimes it's, it's just a changing of the time. And, and so that's happened to me with various stories. And I, I try to be a good listener. And, and similarly, like when stories resonate, like I choose my syllabus largely on kind of like what I'm seeing is resonating with the students. Like I want, I want them to feel like I did when I was 20 and, you know, reading that, that best American short stories anthology and encountering Lori Moore and people like this. I, I want them to have that feeling. You know, so, yeah. I was going to say along those lines, have you noticed what, what sort of shifts, I guess, in, in modes of fiction have you noticed among, among students, you know, are they more interested in certain types of, of fiction than they were when you were starting out or, you know, again, has it accelerated or, uh, or otherwise, you know, yeah, changed? I, yeah. I think that the, one of the big differences is, is the interest in John, like fiction of various genres and kind of blurring genres. So mm -hmm. writing stories that, that have kind of elements of sci-fi elements of fantasy or that are purely sci-fi, purely fantasy, um, and, um, also like having students who will write a story that's, you know, like a sci-fi story. And then for the next story they turn in, it's like realism, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and wanting to work in both, you know, and, and kind of being, um, just excited as excited by, um, you know, a, a you know, a, you know, a, a short story by a kind of realist writer as they are by, you know, you know, someone writing in a different genre. So I don't know It that's been the big difference is the kind of embracing of many genres, the blurring of genres and the kind of like the sense of all of these things can work together. Um, and that that's been interesting to observe. Yeah. yeah. I had wondered reading the book over the last couple of days that disappeared. I was like, the the first couple are in this mode. Is he going to veer into some strange science fiction or, or other oddball, you know, uh, concatenation of genres? Or oh, okay, we're we're sticking in this world. Okay, it's it's you know, it was good to see you know a, a single unifying mode throughout the book. But I did have that moment of, I wonder if it's going to change drastically, or we're we're kind of in a, a certain mode of of a world that you created uh, around you. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I wanted it to, I mean, I tend to like collections that where the, the world feels unified. And so, yeah. yeah. To that end, the the biggest thing, and it's come up in, in the various interviews you've done and, and reviews of the book, that's the most obvious. And you mentioned at the very beginning, everything centers around San Antonio and Austin, including the, the one story titled Rhinebeck, which is based in New York State and nonetheless has Austin as this, this distant beacon to it all. Tell me about your Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I should say I grew up on the East Coast. I, I grew up in Pennsylvania and I went to college in New York and I lived kind of all over the country in my 30s and or 20s at least um, and, and, and part of my 30s. Um, so I've lived a lot of other places, but I've been in Texas for, you know, 20 years about and. Um, that's not a small amount of time. No, it starts <laughs> um, to become your home state after a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, what's interesting about this book is that I didn't, you know, I, I, I never felt inclined to write about San Antonio or Austin, which are kind of the worlds that I'm most familiar with, um, and have spent the most time. 
in Texas. And um, maybe because I was kind of living in those worlds, I, I never felt kind of inclined to go there in my fiction. But one of the big things that shifted was when I wrote that story, Austin, it was the first time of writing about a world that was kind of close to home. And I realized part of the reason for that was the fact, I think, at least in retrospect, um, that I now like had children and this was now kind of my sense of where my family lived had shifted. You know, my, my family was now this family. Um, and, and my, and, and so my sense of home was now Texas, um, for better or worse. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm not decided, making any judgments, although chances are they yeah. won't listen, but, but still, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'm very aware of feelings about Texas, but, but there are wonderful things about Texas. And, and I think one thing I'll say is that the cities of Texas are really different than, than the other parts of Texas. And, um, both San Antonio and, and Austin and, you know, are, are cities that, that I love, um, despite their flaws, uh, for various reasons. And so one of the things that I wanted to do in, in kind of embracing this world, once I realized that I was going to kind of lean into it and, 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 uh, and make this world, the world of the, the book, um, was I did want to kind of celebrate things that I, that I do like about it. And, and, um, I wanted to kind of, yeah, include foods that I liked and, um, you know, aspects of just the, you know, the vegetation and, yeah. you know, just, you know, yeah, just elements of the world that, that I, that I like about it and kind of create my own version of it. Yeah. Yeah. For my, my day job, uh, I would occasionally go to San Antonio for a trade show in the, the the pharmaceutical industry. And early in my career, I, I made a point of getting away from the river walk and like taking a, a five mile walk out to find this used bookstore that, that, you know, I, I hunted down and, and getting out and seeing something in the uh, city other than what we're meant to see as tourists, I guess, you know, just, just, you know, what, what's meant to attract the economic activity. So seeing a, uh, uh, a lived in San Antonio, as opposed to a, a, uh, cliche tourist stereotype, San Antonio was a really nice aspect of the book for me. So, yeah, no, but, it's uh, true. Most people, you know, experience the, the river walk <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and, 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 uh, yeah. So that's, 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 that I was trying to kind of, yeah, I think there's an allusion to it at, at one point in the book, but never a, you know, <laughs> right. much more than that. And not even a dismissive one, just a, yeah, it's over there. But, uh, you know, one, one of the things I found interesting in the, the tone of the book, and I know it's a contemporary fiction thing, that, that, that sense of telling by your narrators, that it's, it's, that the narration isn't to the void, but that assumption that there's a, there's a person on the other end. That, that sense of a listener or a reader being you know, what's helping shape, you know, the, the narration itself. And I, I don't know how conscious or, you know, otherwise uh, uh, deliberate a thing is because your, your stories are very crafted in a good way, very, very technically perfect, uh, which I know you'll blush over, but we're not, you know, face to face right now, so it's okay. <laughs> but that, that sense of telling you know, by, by your narrators, that they are talking to someone, not that it's conversational, conversational, but, but that it has that, that vibe to it. Is that something that's a, uh, again, something that's worked through or just something that you, you find natural in terms of that, that first person sense? Yeah. I think that there's, I mean, tone and voice are really important to me when I'm working on a story. And oftentimes that's what makes me decide to commit to a story is something in the tone of um, the writing for that particular piece. So usually if I set a story aside or discard it, it's because the tone is not really, um, I'm not feeling kind of that character on the other side of the words, um, that kind of soul on the other side of the words, so to speak. And and so that's what I look for. And, and usually if I sense that myself, that's a good sign that it's kind of there. And and it is, I do, I, I, I like a kind of intimate, um, type of voice, a, a reflective, sometimes almost confessional type of voice. Um, and, and I like that myself as a reader, you know, um, but, but I also, I think in, in, um, 
writing these stories, which are really kind of personal experience type stories, um, I do think about that. I want the voice hopefully to, to seem honest and, and conversational and um, intimate. You know, um, I, I go for that at least. I don't, I don't know how well it comes through, but I, I, you know, that's, that's something I aim for. Yeah. I mean, even the, and again, it's a minor thing to pick up on, but how often when a story is beginning, my wife, comma, her name, comma, you know, and, and then the sentence, the idea that you're, you're introducing, you know, that the, the narrator is introducing as though it's, it's, you know, speaking to someone, not just, you know, uh, assuming great knowledge on the part of the reader, but, you know, kind of trying to ground things and, and explain, I guess that's, that's what the stories are. People trying to explain what the hell's happening in their life and then what yeah. middle age is like, which gets us back to that question <laughs> of how's middle age going? <laughs> <laughs> My wife I, asked about how the story is and uh, how the stories are. And I said, it's, it's like being inside an album by the national in a good way, but you yeah. know, there's, there's that sense <laughs> of, of, you know, which you can use as a blurb, feel, feel free. But yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, these are, I see these as a being about, um, one, like my, you know, the, the, the forties, you know, in some ways. And so like, I don't know, I've heard the fifties are, you know, everyone has been saying that they're, this is this is a really great decade, so I'm hopeful. <laughs> oh, so my, I, I I turned fifty during the the uh, f first full year of lockdown. Uh, other weird ass things happened in my life in that span that were you know outside of any prediction. I was like, all things considered, you know, I'll, I'll take the fifties. They're they're treating me well so far. But again, it's only fifty two. I've got another eight years to work through to to you know make sure it's a good decade. I guess. Right. But. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about writing practice and, and writing life. And again, how you had to change as, as a father versus how you used to write in the, uh, in the pre-dad days. Yeah. I mean, in the pre-dad days, writing was like the center of my world. And I scheduled my life around my writing, you know, as, as I, I made sure that there was time for that each day. Um, I tended to write at night, um, and really late at night. So like, you know, my magic hours were like between midnight and four in the morning, <laughs> which is not conducive when, when, when you have young children who are getting up at six in the morning. So everything about that had to change, you know, the kind of, I realized it was kind of an indulgent way to live, like, to, sure. you know, to, and, and, and I had to change all of that to adapt to, right. These, these, these new, uh, lovely people in my life. Um, and, and so, you know, that changed, um, where I wrote, you know, um, my home environment became for a long time, just not a, also not really conducive for a variety of reasons. When you get um, up to what, think and then you step on some Legos. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah. That's, I mean, it's just, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yeah, my, my house looked like a, a Jimboree store. And so it was, <laughs> you know, it just, um, so yeah, I began writing in coffee shops and then I started writing in the library at my university and then a little bit in my office sometimes, um, at school. And I was just kind of trying to figure out how to make it work. And then of course, like the time constraints were enormous. And so, um, just finding those little windows to write. So it was really, this book came about when I finally had a sabbatical and, you know, the kids, you know, were both in, you know, preschool at that point. And so they were away during the days. And I, it was like, I had been storing up this need to write um, for so long. And it just was like the floodgates were open. <laughs> and so almost all of these stories were either started or, or finished during this kind of one period of, you know, maybe about, you know, six to nine months or so. Wow. And, um, I just, I just, uh, it all kind of came out and then, you know, so since then my children are older, it's much easier. I can say things like I, I need a few hours to write and, you know, um, daddy needs like alone that. time is always a good thing. <laughs> yeah. They, they're, they're generally pretty respectful when, when I have, yeah. when I need a certain window and stuff. So like, you know, like that's it's much much easier now i feel like i settled into it but yeah those early years it was like it was really hard had, had you been taking notes at all 
for stories during those years, or is that still just not how it works for you? Yeah, no, I was I was making attempts to write. In some ways, I wish I had just kind of like not tried to write at all and just yeah. kind of just let myself enjoy these years and just said, you know, you'll you'll get back to it. And instead, I was like trying to like, you know, you know, write, you know, in these very tiny windows. And when I was very exhausted and, you know, it was just none of that was usable. And I just ended up kind of torturing myself by trying to make myself do it. So I always tell like when I, when I have friends who are writers who are just having children, I'm like, just like enjoy these years. Like <laughs> writing will, you'll, you'll have that time again. It will come back. It's not going anywhere. Um, but yeah, it's just, yeah, I, I do, I did attempt to do it during those years, but I, I didn't, nothing good really came out yeah. of that. And are there, and this again, riffs off of last week's guest with his short story issues. Um, how often, or does something that didn't work in a novel spill out into becoming a short story? Hmm. Have you had that occur yet? I, again, you've, you've only got the... Has that occurred? I guess. Yeah, I don't know that that I've ever had that experience. I mean, I think that um, when I've worked on novels, it's because it became very clear to me like this was a bigger story and and it was a different thing. Um, and I kind of like when I've worked on novels, it's like okay, I'm in novel writing mode, and when I've worked on stories, I and in story writing mode, it's, it's usually, I kind of have separated them in my mm -hmm. mind in that way. Um, so I don't know that that's happened to me. Um, but I believe that that happens. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories about that type of thing is the author, um, Richard Bausch, who I took a, a, a class with years ago, um, at a writing conference, he told this story about this short story, um, all the way in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a great short story but had started out as a novel and it was like a 600 page novel that he kept, <laughs> he kept revising <laughs> it and um, it kept getting shorter and shorter and it eventually became a short story. And it's this incredible short story that has kind of the depth of a novel, but it is a short story. And um, I remember asking about it. I was like, why well, teach that story? Sometimes it's a great story. <laughs> and he just looked at me. He's like, not worth it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's what I wondered. That sense of like the, the time commitment and the work that went in and the that sunk cost fallacy. Well, I, this was 600 pages. I'm getting 600 pages out of right. this somehow <laughs> instead of these eight pages really, really hold up. But, but yeah, gosh. And talk if you can a little about the, the use of flash or, or short fiction. Real, I mean, you know, super short, a couple of paragraphs in the uh, in the collection too, because you have a few that are spaced out over the the, the course of the disappeared, and then yeah. uh, you know, what is that sort of writing for you? Uh, talk about Flash. <laughs> sure, yeah, you know, I had never, you know, really worked a lot in Flash, um, and so I became interested in it kind of around the same time I was working on these stories. And um, just something I was kind of playing around with and, and kind of doing at the same time. And I could have seen these as kind of two entirely separate projects, um, but they felt connected to me. And again, once I started kind of um, thinking that these would be part of the book, um, I started to kind of consciously choose as the subject matter, like, things that were connected to the setting of like San Antonio or, or Austin, but specifically San Antonio. And so often I would just kind of pick things that I associated with the setting as almost like a prompt for that day. And then I would just kind of sit down. And so that's how stories like the story Pozzole and Chili and Limes, those were just kind of like little like prompts that I gave myself. And I thought, okay, I'm going to take this, image um, that I associate with the world that I live in <laughs> and I'm just going to kind of riff on it and see what happens. And I wrote a lot of those, um, a lot that didn't make their way into the book, but um, quite a few that ended up like just finding their way into journals and some, some of which found their way into the book. And I think I thought of them as this kind of like almost this kind of like connective tissue um, and I wasn't quite sure how they were going to work in the book until I started assembling it. But 
um, I wanted them to be in there. I just, I felt, it felt like part of the same period of, 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 uh, work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, the literary mags, uh, magazines, you know, that, that both a uh, bunch of these pieces in the disappeared are published in as well as some of your flash. Tell me about the state of literary magazines as, as you see it. Cause again, we're the same age and they had a very different level of, of meaning distribution and context when we were in our twenties versus the middle age again, as we, we yeah. talk about. Yeah. No, I think that, I think you're absolutely right. I think it has changed uh, quite a lot. I mean, I think more and more, you know, I think, um, certainly online magazines or even traditional print magazines publishing online content um, that's been the major shift in the fact that there was kind of initially, I think, some skepticism about that or resistance to it. Um, there was some sense that, you know, maybe an online journal was not as prestigious as a print journal. And, and that existed for a lot of years. But I think that has definitely changed, too, so that um, many of the, the very best places to publish are, are online. And I think one of the easiest ways to connect with readers as a short story writer is through publishing work that's either published in a print journal that then republishes it online or through journals that are purely like online. And so I think that in that sense, the, the literary journal is kind of alive and well, I think it's just kind of taken a different form. Um, I don't know the numbers, like whether it's many people subscribe to literary journals. Um, I just think that the wor that world is a little bit different. Um, they're not things that you can only find in, you know, on the shelves of, of your independent bookstore or in the stacks of the library. Um, I think that people go to find them online now, you know, um, and, and, and are introduced to a lot of their content online. And, and that's just, that's been probably the most dramatic shift. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I just think of those old days when we had that big hardcover writer's guide and, and all that. Oh, and all the yeah. Place, yeah. <laughs> <All those laughs> the writer's places. market. And, yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. I mean, it's, I think, um, you know, you know, from my perspective, I think that's been the big shift is just the way that, um, I think now like writers, like I think of younger writers, like my students or students who I had not too many years ago who are now in MFA programs or out in the world publishing, like they publish in journals where um, a lot of them are kind of online and, and then the content's available online and then they introduce it to readers through social media and they have instant kind of readership and reactions. And I think a lot of that, um, I don't know. Again, like I'm, I'm maybe not the best person to answer this question, but that's kind of been the big shift from my perspective. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's the same thing I talk about with a lot of, well, again, with, with cartoonists and the guys who came up in the, the, the mini comic and zine era, how once upon a time you mailed everything out to people and mm -hmm. maybe three, six months later, somebody sends you a, a card, you know, about your work saying they like it as opposed to, you know, mashing the, the like button on Instagram or something like that. Um, <laughs> it's a very different approach to, to, you know, how one got audience or built an audience and how, how one, you know, received feedback and when. But I only say this because I, I made my second zine of, of the last three years. I just got it back last week and I've started mailing them out to people. And I know this is going to be one of those. I send them all, and then I sit around wondering why nobody is writing or commenting. And and I understand the mail U.S. Post Office does take a while to to send things. Speaking of which, I'll get your address after this and and send you something. But um, yeah, but yeah, it's it's again, we're, it's being in a different world. And for you, being so in touch with students over the years and seeing what not just what their expectations of fiction are, but you know what uh, we'll say the market should be, or at least you know. Mm -hmm how they should be out there, um, you know, making work, distributing their work and, and, you know, getting published is, a. it must be very, very, um, I would say different and you see it happening incrementally over the course of your career. So, um, 
I'm yeah, glad you're making it, a uh, go of it, though. <laughs> so. it, it's different. I mean, it's it's and and I try not to kind of fall into you know um, when I was <clears> young, <throat> blah blah blah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really try. I mean, I think that's in some ways like having a kind of more open attitude has saved me a little bit from getting um, being too cynical about things. I, I really try to kind of just observe what they're doing and 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 accept that that the world changes and that this is things are different now and and. Um, one thing I will say that's really heartening is that I don't see the kind of, even though I hear this from a lot of people, at least among my students, like I don't see kind of their desire to read fading. Like mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of amazing what great readers they are, um, you know, particularly this generation. And, and not only that, but like that they love books and they, many of my students you know they have like bookstagrams and they have yeah. all of this stuff yeah. that they're doing which is great i mean they just like celebrating books they love books they get excited about books and and that's encouraging to see when there's so much competing for their attention these days you know i don't know coming up in this generation if i would have you know um fallen under the spell of books in the way that some of my students have you know it's kind of it's kind of astonishing. Um, yeah, I do sort of wonder about the, the you know, if I knew then or if I was starting out now, you know, how different would things be, I guess. I yeah. do know from reading about your, your way back background that cloud backups would have would have changed your career <laughs> significantly. Uh, you may as well tell the story. I, I, I'll mangle it somewhat, but uh, you lost uh, uh, a lot of writing once upon a time uh, as I yeah. So right a year out of, of my year after Iowa, I went, I moved to Houston and I lived there for a year on a fellowship. I had, you know, this really great fellowship that allowed me to just write for a year. Um, and, uh, and during that year, I kind of worked on my first collection of stories and being the kind of private writer that I am, I was just kind of working on them on my own and not showing them to too many people. Um, and this was all, it wasn't pre-internet, but I just wasn't connected. It was pre-cloud though. It, yeah, it, it was, was pre-cloud and yeah. I was just not really, um, you know, I was kind of backing up my stuff in the traditional way, which was on those little discs <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I had a, a whole like, you know, a cabinet full of these discs and I, I was pretty good at backing things up. Um, but but toward the end of that year, when I was really coming close to finishing this this first book, um, my apartment in Houston was broken into while I was over at a friend's house watching a basketball game. And, um, and I came home that night and I had been completely cleaned out. And, you know, my computer, everything I own basically was taken, but that included my computer and the backup disks. And... Um, even this one briefcase that I had that contained all the printed out hard copies. And I somehow like, I don't know what I was thinking, but I put them all in this briefcase and uh, that had a lock on it. And it was a briefcase. My parents had gotten me like when I graduated from yeah. college, like, like hoping I would have a career that would require like that type of briefcase. Um, <laughs> hand, hand, and, yeah. <laughs> and and my my hard copies of my stories were literally the most valuable thing I owned in my own mind. And so I kept them locked in this briefcase. <laughs> and of course, the people who robbed me were like, oh, like, must whatever be good in there, there must be like valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so they took that. So I just really had almost nothing to show for all the writing I'd done up in, to that point in my life, which was like basically everything I'd done in in college and in grad school and, and during that, that really pretty fruitful year after grad school when I'd been writing this book. So I, I, I really lost like a book. Yeah. Um, and with the exception of a few stories that, that remained, um, but, or that I had published. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was hugely, you know, uh, devastating. And, and that was kind of like the period after I'd my children, that was like another period where I just, it was a kind of, um, a couple year period where I was just trying to orient myself again in my yeah. life. <laughs> and, you know, I, and, I, I hesitate to, to give you the time machine to, to do this, but, uh, clearly the short story about a low level criminal publishing 
fiction that he stole from some other guy's place would have been a starting point for you. Maybe, you know, a novel about a man you know, <laughs> publishing all of your stories under his name. Uh, I'm yeah. just saying that's, that's, you know, this is where my, this is why I don't actually finish anything. I just come up with the ideas for this stuff and, and never actually, you know, follow through. I know. But, but I feel like you have to have compassion for all your characters and I, I wouldn't be able to muster it. I don't think. True. True. That would have been pretty tough, but you did mention basketball. You, uh, you a Spurs guy or you, uh, I do love the Spurs, and it's Good. been hard to be a Spurs fan in Last couple recent of years. Year, but they ha they have the first pick in this year's. Uh, we we draft, got the, so, uh, the, yeah. the 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 French. Uh, yes. I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but Wemby, the the, the Wemby, gigantic yeah. French uh, rookie coming in. But but yeah, I, yeah. I was a Nets. Uh, well, I used to be a Knicks guy. Adopted the Nets once. Um, I gave up on cheering for the Knicks because they always let me down. It was better to just cheer for a bad team. And yeah. then the Nets got good with with Jason Kidd, and that that made things really difficult for me. Um, but the Spurs always became the you know they do things right. They're they're a team I can enjoy <laughs> watching. I know people thought Tim Duncan was boring, but to me it was a, a joy to watch him play. So yeah, yeah. there were yeah. a lot of great years. I mean, I I, I moved here right at kind of the you know some of the early years of that and so i got i got to see a lot of that and um it's yeah i mean they're deeply important to the city it's it's kind of the only show in town is the spurs sure. and so um yeah it's we're, we're hopeful that this will be the beginning of another era um but it's been it's kind of funny because i had you know my my son is obsessed with basketball he's he's only eight but he just loves basketball okay. And even though I dressed him in like Spurs, like onesies and Spurs gear, like, you know, it's from a very young age, um, he, he kind of, um, uh, you know, really kind of fell in love with Steph Curry. I was just going to say, it's got to be yeah. Steph. <laughs> All the kids love Steph because there's he's, just, there is nothing I can do about it. And then, you know, it's just, um, and then after they won like the championship last year, it was just solidified and it's just, so anyway, I'm hopeful I can eventually lure him back to the, <laughs> we'll see. Well, once they start winning again, it'll be, uh, you know, easier to, to yeah. indoctrinate him, I guess. But, <laughs> uh, I guess not a, a last, last question, but we're, we're getting there. Um, this, this collection came out uh, just a couple of months ago. I hate to ask this without jinxing it. Next project. Looking at more yeah. stories or, uh, or or longer form? Yeah, no, I'm working, you know, so I've been working on a novel um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, without saying too much about it, it's, 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 it is um, a different type of world. It's kind of like um, um, 1980s uh, Southern California um, and uh, it's kind of coming of age. Um, and uh, it's about a lot of, things. It's partly about academia. It's about, um, skateboarding. <laughs> it's, I won't say too much about it, but it's, it's kind of, um, uh, 1980s Southern California kind of captures a, a certain vibe, at least for those of us who grew up with fast times at Richmond high. And, right. Uh, exactly. It's, it's, it's of that world. Um, and yeah, I wrote it, you know, started writing it during, um, the pandemic. Um, and it was, it was kind of born out of um, just wanting to be in a different time, you know, yeah. and I think I associate, you know, the eighties of my childhood as just a kind of simpler world. And I was just kind of like, yeah, wanted to, I had a lot of fun just <laughs> returning to that world every day. It was very much an escapist <laughs> experience. Writers I know who have written, yeah, well, it's not contemporary writers who are writing pre-internet, pre-cell phone talk about how absolutely liberating it is, like just writing about worlds where you didn't have the ability to, to be in touch with somebody constantly, where you didn't have to create a plot element so that someone didn't have their phone on them or that you couldn't just Google things. Um, it, 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 the nostalgia for that, I guess, when it comes to you know what it means to be able to write more freely has a... Uh, this recurring theme, I guess, for, for some of the other guys I've spoken to. But. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of friends who kind of returned to earlier times in their work during the, and, or else like went into the future in a darker way. Yeah. <laughs> Cause they all things but, considered, I'd rather go in the eighties. You know? <laughs> we have better music too. Yeah. <laughs> But last question, and I, I should have warned you this was coming, especially because you were so kind to, to, you know, come on last minute like this. Who are you reading? 
Sure. Um, See, some people draw a blank on that one, but I kind of figured you'd, you'd have a good roster. So yeah, I really, you know, um, I know I'm late coming to these books, but um, I'm reading Transit, um, the Rachel Cost. I only read that last year for the first time, uh, the the trilogy. So you know. yeah, why well, I'm doing it really slowly. Like the beginning of last summer, I read Outline, and I absolutely adored it. And I I kind of decided in my mind that I wasn't going to rush through it because things are starting to get busy with my book. And I was like, I'm going to wait till my life is calm again to read transit. And now I'm, I think I'm just going to like, wait <laughs> till next <laughs> summer to read the, the, the final uh, kudos, I guess is the last one. Yeah. But I just, I mean, these books are um, incredible and such a delight on the, le the level of the sentence. And just, they're just so different than anything else I've ever read. Um, so I've been reading that I've done some rereads recently. Um, periodically I reread housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. It's a kind of touchstone book. And I reread that when I was doing some traveling, um, just on the plane, um, the days of abandonment. I also, um, the, um, Elena Ferrante, um, novel, uh, and then I, I'm reading, I just got, um, this collection zigzagger manuel munoz and i i um recently read his his most recent collection the consequences which um is brilliant and just a, a beautiful collection of stories and so i wanted to go back and read this earlier book which has been recommended to me so um those are yeah i mean so that that's kind of the next one um but i'm reading transit so slowly because it's like I just, I, I like almost want to read it one page a day or something. It's so yeah. pleasurable. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. There, there's certain aspects. When I found myself reading it too quickly, it was, in terms of transit, it, it was dissipating in a certain way. And that, you know, if I've, you spend more time, you linger over everything, you get a lot more out of it. It's also one that I don't think is served well by being read on a Kindle. I think like the physical print book is is very important for certain uh certain pieces of of writing but yeah that book that, is but i mean i i know that the font like everything about that book is just perfect it's or yeah. those series um or that series is just you know it, yeah it is one of those books you want to hold and, yeah. indeed so i want to thank you for for coming on andrew i i enjoyed the heck out of this book and i have your two previous ones now on my my wish list because God knows when I'll have spare time to, to actually be able to read books that aren't for the, the podcast that week. But these stories, they're very special. I, you, well, you've heard this stuff from people before, but you've uh, you've really written an amazing short story collection, especially for, uh, <laughs> say, men of a certain age, I guess. But I think universal. So well, thank you. Thank you. That, that means a lot to me. And I, I have I love this conversation, too, and, and just becoming acquainted uh, more acquainted with your podcast and I will be an eager uh, and, and an avid listener um, from this point on. This was really a delight. Thanks so much. And that was Andrew Porter. I was just floored by his, his new story collection, The Disappeared, which is out now from Knopf. So Go give that a read. I, I think our conversation gives you some idea of the the flavor of it, although not the the sheer beauty of his prose in, in it. And anyway, give it a read. The Disappeared by Andrew Porter. Now, you should also check out Andrew's website, andrewporterwriter.com, for more of his, his writing, his previous books, uh, past interviews, and, and more. He's also on Twitter as andrewporter one all one word, and on Instagram as andrew.porter.writer. I'll have links to all of that in the show and episode notes for this one. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast that comes out every week as long as the host doesn't freak out, and he manages to have these great conversations with really fascinating, creative people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or music or piece of theater or art exhibition or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by uh, email, by DM, um, by postcard or letter. You can figure out my address if you subscribe to our Substack, or by leaving a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973 869 Nine six five nine. 
That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you go over that, you'll get cut off. Just call back and leave the rest. And let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something interesting to, to share with the listeners, but I would never do that without the speaker's permission. So uh, let me know. Now, if you got money to spare, don't give it to me. My day job treats me pretty well, and my expenses are pretty minimal for the show, all things considered. Um, so I'd rather you helped out individuals or institutions in need. You can help out people through uh, GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Crowdfunder, and all those crowdfunding platforms. If you're looking to help uh, with institutions in need, then I give to my local food bank every month. I give to the Poor People's Campaign. I make targeted election contributions, but I'm a lobbyist in my day job, so that's part of that. Um, But there are other things you can do. Uh, Planned Parenthood and Women's Choice Funds, Freedom Funds. There are a lot of things you can do with your money to to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. And as I mentioned earlier, I did get the second issue of my zine, Haiku for Business Travelers, uh, back from the printer, and I have a second printing of the first issue on the way. The new one is 32 pages of essays, poems, photography, art, and an excerpt of my great conversation with Clive James. If you'd like either of those issues, uh, or both, drop me a line. I'll need your mailing address because this is print only. Um, They're free, but if you want to send me some money to support that effort, as opposed to supporting the podcast, uh, you can use paypal.me slash vmspod, or subscribe to my substack at vmspod.substack.com. I mean, become a paying subscriber. It's like 50 bucks a year and Well, anyway, it would be a nice gesture on your part and help defray some of the thousand dollars for printing, about a dollar twenty five for every uh, mailer that I do domestically, another four dollars for each international one that I send. But again, I'm willing to eat the cost because I'm a gigantic egotist who just wants to uh, spread his information virus out into the world. So that's that. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading. Keep making art and keep the conversation going. 